Hello all. Before we begin, this story is part of what I will call the Threshold of Evil Expanded Universe. For context, feel free to listen to the narrations on screen. All are found in the description. Thank you, and enjoy. Case file, um, number two, I guess. I think my fight with Cusham counts as my first encounter to file. But here's the shocking story about a recent discovery I made. Date, May 13th, 2021. I had set up camp in that little-known town of Auburndale, but now I'm a monster hunter, trying to stop a war from breaking out between humans and alien monsters, but I guess it's also because I wanted something more out of life than the normal, routine world that was offered to me, especially since thoughts of my ex-wife still linger in my head. But just so we're clear, I'm not living by that cliffside. I don't need Cusham wanting to kill me again. This time, I bought a mobile home closer towards the town center and have been reconnecting with some of the locals that helped me the first time I had to deal with the monster of Auburndale Forest Reserve. Well, now you know why it hasn't been destroyed by the government. Recently, I'd taken up a new hobby that some would say is extremely dangerous, becoming a fully-fledged monster hunter. This hobby allows me to travel around, using most of my funds in the process of buying special gear like tactical clothing, stab-resistant gloves, steel-toed boots, night vision goggles, and a variety of weapons, including an AK-47, Benelli M1014, and my favorite handgun, a Beretta M9. Just don't ask me where I got them. That being said, I still have to work a typical job just like everyone else, spending my time doing what I was always good at. Construction. Uh, perhaps I might even build my own house one day. Regardless, I still had to prepare for that war that has been brewing. We were going to need allies if we were going to prevent humanity from being drawn into something they clearly weren't ready for. Though, considering that these aliens aren't immune to human weapons, I'm confident that we would beat them. But should a war break out, the death toll would be staggering. Also, the relationship between Cusham and I has been... cool. About two months ago, I decided to go back to his territory to check on him. He would be a great asset in the coming battles ahead. Unfortunately, he's rather distant with me. He doesn't attack me anymore, and he seems to be allowing me to inch closer into the woods. I thought at any moment he would take this opportunity to kill me, but not once has he made an attempt. Not even to intimidate me. So my hunch is that he knows that more primordials will show up wanting his land and his subjugation, so he's willing to weigh his options on who his allies might have to be. Think of it as America and Russia versus Germany in World War II. We're not friends, but we kind of have a mutual reason for cooperation. But something odd happened a few days ago that I'm going to tell everyone about. I found a city underground. And let me tell you, I thought I was going to lose my mind if I stayed there any longer. There were some things down there that I'd like to never see ever again. Well, I say it was underground, but that would be an incorrect statement. The correct way of saying this is you have to go underground in order to get to it. It happened on a Wednesday. I was reading through a forum on the deep web that talked about unusual phenomena that were found in local news articles, police reports, and folktales. Auburndale was one of these discussions, but there was a new article that was posted by someone named Cardio G. They said, Pancake people. That's right. I found a few blobs of flesh in the woods that were able to speak some incoherent words to me. I'm not making this up. Normally, I would have chalked this up to they're making it up, but they had pictures of what they saw and even a brief recording. When I watched it, I saw these pancake-shaped blobs that had eyes, blood, and a variety of different skin colors all meshed together. A few people were quick to disregard it, but I decided to reply to their post. Where are these woods located? I'm an investigator, and I'd like to take a look around. For the rest of the day, I didn't get a reply. The next day, though, I saw that they did respond. 
Smithland, Kentucky. It's a little out of the way, and I was just going for a walk when I stumbled upon them. I thought about going to the police, but I didn't want to get involved. I went over to check on them yesterday and saw that they were gone. I don't know who could have moved them. If you want to go looking, be my guest. I leaned back in my chair and thought about it. Looking up the town on the map, I saw that it was a little out of the way, but it wasn't too bad. I can be there within an hour or two. I packed my things, and after an hour and a half, I arrived at the sleepy town. The person who posted was right. It looked rather empty around here, but perhaps it was just this location. I wasn't sure where exactly to start, so I just looked for the largest patch of woods that I could find. That wasn't too hard to choose from. Patch of forest after patch of forest, I wasn't able to find anything that appeared to be a flat blob. The sun was already setting, and I'd wasted the whole day looking around for something that either doesn't exist, or it genuinely had left the area. Which is a real shame, because I was hoping for something interesting that happened. Even if it was mundane, perhaps I could have talked to the blobs. I was doing one last round in a patch of woods that was a little to the north of the town, looking at the endless rows of trees with disappointment quickly catching up to my optimism. Just when I was going to give up, I came across a rather large depression in the dirt. I thought that maybe this was a sinkhole that was quickly buried over, but I heard something calling out to me. It was coming from the center. Help me. I was hesitant to try and walk out there, but if there was someone who was in need of help, I couldn't leave them. I treaded carefully as I made my way towards the center of the depression and stared down. Sure enough, there was an eye poking out. A human eye. I moved some of the dirt away from around it, but never did I see a nose, mouth, or any other facial features. Just long stretches of human skin. What in God's name? Suddenly... Long, emaciated arms started stretching out of the dirt and surrounding me. They were as black as the night, as their grip on my legs was unbreakable. I tried to get the fingers off me, but they wouldn't budge. Before I could even think of grabbing my handgun, I was pulled into the dirt and found myself submerged. I began hyperventilating, knowing full well that you can hold your breath longer when you do that than holding it in as long as you can. A part of me was praying that I would be able to breathe soon enough, but soon I was starting to lose consciousness and had to resist the urge to breathe in. Not too long afterwards, I woke back up and saw that I was laying inside what appeared to be an abandoned coffee shop. Next to me was a small depression of dirt that had penetrated through the marble flooring. Had I fallen up or down... No matter. I needed to find my way home. I left the shop, but quickly noticed a green hue in the sky. Sickly clouds that overcasted and rained a green haze down onto the city. I wasn't getting hit by it, but knew it was moving towards me. I walked across the street, finally seeing the pancake-shaped blobs littered all around. They looked just like the video. They wiggled, but appeared stationary. What was more concerning was the black veins that were crawling across the landscape. Hello? I shouted. I listened attentively. Nothing. Again, I shouted. Hello? Is there anyone around who can walk on two legs? A distant but animalistic screeching could be heard coming from the left of me. That's not good. I backed away and started checking all the cars to see if I could drive one of them. They were either out of gas or their keys were missing. I don't know how to jumpstart one, although I probably should be practicing. Just when I was about to give up and start looking for another hole to climb down in, I heard the pattering of boots against water. Hold up, a female voice called out to me. I looked around, trying my best to see if I could find whoever it was but somehow they got behind me and pressed a gun against my back, saying, Turn around with your hands up, make any move towards your gun, and you'll find yourself dead. 
I did exactly as she said, and when our eyes met, I saw that she was a teenager. She was wearing winter clothes with plastic wrap underneath. Her eyes also appeared callous, dead inside. Those eyes were enough to tell me that she had seen quite a few horrible things, enough to drive away any semblance of humanity inside her. Look, I said, I'm not from around here. I was just investigating some weird sightings back in Kentucky. She lowered her handgun and appeared confused. What? You're telling me you haven't lived here this whole time? Uh, no. I just got here a little while ago. It hasn't even been a full day, I believe. She took a few steps back and started looking all around with panic in her eyes. Is there really a connection? She muttered. She kept looking back and forth, eagerly trying to find something. But she turned back towards me, just as quickly, and grabbed me by the sleeve, dragging me forward and saying, Where? Where did you come from? Please. I resisted a little, but I could tell that she was scared. She looked like she had been scared for a long time. I said, Hold on, let's just slow down for a moment. I was in a coffee shop over there. When I pointed in that direction, she released her grip and quickly started running towards that building. I followed after her, and when we reached the shop, I saw her by the depression in the ground, eagerly trying to dig through the dirt with her bare hands. I, uh, hey, I don't think that's gonna work. Then help me. I mean, it's pretty much caved in. I don't care. I need to get out of here. I rested my hand on her shoulder, and she ignored it. She kept digging and digging for about a few more minutes before she gave up. There's no way back through there. She exhaled in defeat. She lifted her hands to her face and started crying. It was a little awkward for me, but I could see the desperation in her eyes, the hopelessness in her cries. Let's go somewhere to rest up. It seems to me you've been trying to survive for a while now. I thought she ignored me, but she slowly got to her feet and started for the door, saying with a growl, Fine, but you better not try anything on me. I won't hesitate to kill you. I swallowed fearfully. I wasn't too sure how much she had gone through to resort to something like that already, but all I wanted to do was get out of here too but I needed to know why this city was here. At least she seemed capable of defending herself. But as we left the store, we were suddenly surrounded by two guys with deranged eyes staring at us. Oh, uh, hello there. I tried to de-escalate immediately. I hadn't had my gun ready, but shooting them wasn't something I wanted to do. A deadly light beast, sure. A human being... Still not ready for that can of worms. The crazy old guy cackled. Two choice meals, Jim. The guy on the left, whose hair looked as if it had fallen out, replied. The girl will be much more useful. I guess the man will make for a full meal. Hey, guys, how about we not do this? It'd be better for everyone if we went our separate ways. What do you say? The old man replied nastily. No dice. We ran out of food, and people are running out too. Can't say I'm proud, but survival of the fittest, you know. Cannibals. I had never met any before, but I was already preparing to fight if I could grab my weapon in time. The two tried to give us the jump, but their starvation had given us the advantage. They were irrational animals, and slow. They gave me time to react, and missed the old man's swing of his machete. I tossed him to the ground, but the girl pulled out her handgun again and simply shot her attacker. Her straight-to-the-point attitude scared me, and I knew not to mess with her. But the no hesitation in her murder was even more frightening. But she shocked me again when she turned her gun towards my guy and shot him in the head. Jesus, you didn't have to do that! I yelled. She had a cold glare in her eyes and said, Yes, I had to. Holstering her gun, she led the way, leaving me alone with my thoughts. 
I took one last look at the men, rationalizing that it was probably for the best. Survival of the fittest. His own words. But I did have one thing to say to her to make sure everything was cool between us. Need to make sure I can lower her hostilities before they turn on me. My name's Henry. She didn't stop walking, but spoke casually back. Samantha. At least things were calm with us now. We made it to an abandoned apartment building. We had to go through numerous back alleys and go as deep as it would go. I asked, Why do you have a home all the way in here? Wouldn't it be safer to go for the tallest building, or is there a danger that I should know about? I assume you heard that roaring earlier. That creature is big enough to destroy entire skyscrapers, so I find it best to get as far in these buildings as possible. I see. We went up a flight of stairs and made it to her room. I should have expected a teenager to be collecting tons of garbage and things that they don't need, but definitely want. How long have you been living here by yourself? I asked. She ignored my question and threw a sleeping bag at me. Funny. I already had one, but it was lighter than this. Here. You're going to be here for a while. And don't even think about going outside at this time. I looked over to the window and saw that it was raining. The rain had a green color to it, which I thought was odd. What's wrong with the rain? I guessed if that was the issue. It does terrible things to those who get touched by it. She looked like she was about to cry. I decided not to push it any further, but it seems like I guessed correctly. There's something dangerous about the rain here. And whatever it was, it has left a bad memory on her. I sat down on the ground and started unpacking some of my things, and she approached closer to me, having this look like she wanted to ask me questions. I had a feeling I knew what it was, so I tried to get a conversation going. So, you want to know what's going on back on Earth? I looked at her. Yeah, she mumbled. Well, we have a pandemic going on, but I'd say that's the least of our problems, especially since there's a much bigger threat lurking. Wait, what's the bigger threat? Uh, corruption of government, climate change, potential war between rivaling countries. Oh, and a bunch of ancient beings that came to Earth millions of years ago are threatening to start up a genocidal campaign against humanity. She raised her eyebrows and sat down next to me with her legs crisscross. Are you joking about that last one? I can understand the other stuff, but that one sounds a little out of the ordinary. No. Telling you the truth. I'm actually thinking about joining the side that doesn't want these things to succeed in wiping out humanity. There's a side like that? Yeah. I'm so far the only one, but I might be able to convince one of the monsters to join my side if I give him a little incentive. I pinched my fingers whilst giving her a smirk. Incentive? Like what? I let him take more land. I just haven't had the time to tell him yet. Well, at least there's someone who cares. Here, people are devolving into savages. She muttered before growing quiet. I'm surprised that there's still other people around. I was starting to think you were the only one here. She hissed. Besides the flesh blobs, the fungus walkers, and the... She trailed off like she was refusing to utter its name. I wanted to ask her more, seeing that there were a lot of unanswered questions on her side, but I figured it wouldn't be worth it. Be careful, sleeping. In case things get really bad, I like to wear the shock collar to sleep. She handed one to me, and I was just about going to laugh if she thought I was going to put on a dog collar. I'll pass. I insist. Her eyes were serious. Something was definitely up, and sleep was the issue. Gonna fill me in? I asked. She turned back and walked towards her room. She said before closing the door, No, as long as you're wearing it, you should be fine. I wear one too, just so you know, so you don't have to feel stupid. But why not tell me why? 
She pointed to her arm and said that she wouldn't mention anything of them. She seemed scared to utter what was to happen. What did sleeping have to do with arms, I thought. Well, I didn't want to go to sleep now. I tried to pass the time by looking for a phone signal, which proved to be in vain, so I kept trying to remember some of the weird hieroglyphs I found in a cave back in Cusham's forest. I remember there being a depiction of a beam of light traveling up, but not so far above the ground. What were those called? I asked myself. The pillar of light was surrounded by rocks that resembled Stonehenge, but what exactly were they about? Cushum wasn't going to tell me, though I am thankful that he doesn't seem to have a taste for me anymore. He's ignored me every time I've gone exploring his woods now. I remember going to a Native American that lived in the area. He said it was something, a sort of bridgeway between worlds and realms. Was it an Anubis point? No, no, it's something else. Besides, Anubis is some Egyptian god. It was a nexus. Yeah, a nexus point. And if she's from Earth, and this whole city's from Earth... And that means the town must have fallen into a nexus point. And now it's on another plane of reality. But if there's a nexus point here that can bring the city to this dimension, that means the nexus point is still around, especially since it was able to bring me here, and it seems like she's been here for much longer. All we really gotta do is go looking for it. This is my only shot at getting back home. About an hour or two had passed, and I was already starting to feel the effects of sleep deprivation. With nothing to do, boredom was setting in, and boredom makes it harder to stay awake. I was already tired from today, and I desperately wanted to try and keep my eyes open. I tried walking back and forth, but that was proving a little more noisy than I expected. I didn't want to disturb the girl. I sat down and kept looking at the shock collar. I really didn't want to wear it. It looked so uncomfortable. After bouncing my legs for about ten minutes, I conceded and put it on. Not about to do something stupid, like I know what's best for me. But she's lived here for quite some time, and if she says it's necessary, then I'd be wise to heed her advice. I was just as uncomfortable as you would expect. I laid back into my sleeping bag and stared at the wall for a good while. I wasn't sure how much time had passed, but... Eventually, I was overcome by sleep. I opened my eyes to find myself standing at the edge of a cliff. The trees that were down below reminded me of the Auburndale Forest Reserve. It was dark, foggy, and surprisingly cold. I turned around and saw the charred remains of my old house. Nothing about this felt right. My senses were completely aware, and I was having a level of consciousness that shouldn't have been possible in a dream state. It was as if I was awake while dreaming. A strong gust of wind overtook me, blowing away the embers of my destroyed home and tossing it over the edge of the cliff like a climactic plume of smoke that descended deep into the oblivion of trees. But the cold was growing worse. My whole body was tingling, and I felt an overwhelming amount of dread suffocating my rationale. My heart rate was intensifying to a degree that made it feel deathly painful. Every inch of my body was screaming to me that I was in mortal danger. I kept looking around, frantically looking up at the night sky above, but only seeing a green mist that was descending towards me. I felt a liquid escape my eyes. Was I crying? Why was I crying? But when I went to wipe it, there was a green, sticky liquid attached to my finger. My finger started to dissolve and turn into an elastic substance and fall towards the ground. My legs were shaking and I was brought to my knees shortly afterwards. I looked over the edge of the cliff, unsure of why all this was happening. But when I looked closer, I could see something far more earth-shatteringly worse. Those weren't trees that I was looking at. Those were arms. Long, emaciated, charcoal-black arms. Their fingers stretched out painfully, clasping quickly for anything that might come within their reach. Suddenly, they all turned towards me. 
They reached up, wishing to grab hold of me. I was still too far up from their height, but they kept whispering to me. All those whispers were slowly turning into screams of torment. They were in agony, and wanted to pull me in and force me to join them in their misery. What are they? I wanted to back away, escape from this nightmare. My legs refused to budge, and I desperately wanted to find a way to end my life. I did not want to go and join them. The idea of spending eternity in everlasting torture and to be pulled away from their hateful despair to strip me of my body and leave my mind to rot with time itself was enough for me to want the freedom of death. Then, a pair of hands came up behind me and pushed me over the edge. I was falling, falling, falling. I looked up and saw more arms growing out from the top. They were everywhere. Their extent was all things that existed, and they would have what they wanted. I looked down and saw that I was approaching the sea of arms, making it easier to begin their destruction of me. I screamed. I was screaming so loud, crying out to be spared this. And then I felt an intense shock around my neck. I threw myself up, my body covered in a cold sweat. The girl had already opened her door, and she was just staring at me. I looked around, realizing where I was, and that I was safe again. Safe from the world of nightmares. What? Dear God, what was that? I held my hands to my heart, trying to calm down my painful breathing. That's why I wear a shock collar. It's always there to wake you up right before they take you. She had this coldness in her voice. She didn't seem concerned with me, confident that she had gotten her point across. But before she closed the door, I said to her in my most sincere voice, Thank you. My God. Thank you. (laughs) It's okay. After a while, you get used to it and learn to ignore the adrenaline rush that it gives you each time. Though, I doubt you'll get any more sleep, this being your first night. First night? This is going to be my last night. I thought she was crazy if she thought I was going to spend another moment in this realm. I needed to find a nexus point and get back to Earth. This city just didn't pop here by random chance. It was brought here. The question is, where is the epicenter of this lost city? I had spent nearly every waking hour for the past few days now trying to find some means of escape. From under bridges to the top of skyscrapers, I checked every nook, cranny, and back alley. I was much too afraid of going into the sewer system, especially since Samantha has warned me against giant monsters lurking nearby. I'm glad to say that I haven't seen any. She mentioned a few days back that not long after the city was enveloped by the event, she and her friends managed to cause one large monster to fall into a sinkhole and die. The same hole that she fell in, thus separating her from her friends who she now believes are likely dead. She told me how originally they thought that it was an escape from this world. She was the only one who fell in first but the bottom turned out to be nothing more than rocks and dirt. She barely avoided getting crushed by this mysterious monster. Who killed it? I asked. I fell on the soft dirt near the edges. It fell in the center on a large boulder and broke its neck. She spoke a little amused. I too found this story pretty funny, actually. But one particularly frustrating morning especially since I could see another round of those green clouds rolling in on me, Samantha, who had been accompanying me, said, Just give up. It's pointless. There's no beam of light that's around here. I've looked everywhere, and I've never seen anything so out of place as that. Plus, there's less people, so less likely to find further info. For context, I told her about the Nexus points. Sam... Don't you want to leave this place? I know it's too late for your friends, but you need to believe that you'll still have a chance. And I'm not going to give up. I didn't survive a potential face mauling just to get trapped in another dimension. 
I've been here for months now. I struggle to sleep at night all the time, and you're going through my supplies and not helping me to replenish. I won't abandon you, but if you think that we need to go our separate ways for right now, I understand. I'll come get you if I find the way out. I thought that maybe this was going to be the moment where she wanted to stay with me and continue our little search. I thought we had built some sort of connection. But she turned around and left me high and dry. I felt rather betrayed, but I guess I walked into that one. Regardless, she did tell me to stay out of the rain, and I made it my mission to always do so. I also tried not to step on any of the blobs. I later found out that they were humans, animals, and even some plants. Some mixed together, becoming bigger blobs. I expanded my search in the rural areas. There was no food around here, and I was already starting to get hungry. And drinking water wasn't dangerous, especially since the green rain removed all the germs from the water. Perhaps I should have gone in and grabbed some food supplies before heading out to the countryside. That's when I came across something weird. There was a hole in the middle of the road I had been traveling on, along with a single blob next to it. Two eyes opened and stared at me. They were human, and they appeared to be almost content with their situation. I guess after a while you have to accept the fact that you're no longer a movable creature anymore. I wonder if this sinkhole was the same one that Sam fell into. But my search had to press on. I was heading towards the large barrier that Samantha had told me about, and when I got there, a sudden panic attack triggered when I saw what the barrier was made of. I gripped hard on my heart, watching as I saw a swirling maelstrom of blackened arms that were rubbing up against each other, shrouding themselves in a black fog and creating a tight-knit wall that you wouldn't want to even try to pass through. Samantha mentioned how one of her friends went through and she was ripped apart by their menacing grip. There had to be a way to break a hole in it. Surely this isn't some sort of indestructible barrier. Although, if my frequent dreams of these things have told me anything, they're incredibly solid. The plan was set, then. I needed to break through this barrier. I wasn't sure how thick it was, but it's better than staying here forever. I returned back to Samantha's home, and after using the key she gave me, I found her in her room. Her face had a sorrowful look. When she saw that I was back, she put up a dismal attempt to hide her downhearted feelings. So, she sniffed. Ready to give up this pointless quest of yours? Although I couldn't tell that that was what she wanted me to say... I wondered if she was also hoping that I would be coming to her with good news. News that I knew how to get out. Uh, Samantha, I haven't found the exit yet, but I do have an idea on how to get out. She looked at me with a curious expression. I could tell she was confused, and I would have to elaborate further on my plan. Once I was done telling her, she took a deep inhale and said, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. What? Why? That barrier surrounds the entire city and nearby farmland. I've never once found an exit point. And that's why we test out the barrier's strength. Why should I? She turned away from me and buried her face into her pillow. I kept forgetting that she's just a teenager and hasn't had to do anything other than what she's wanted to do all this time. I never had a kid, but I wasn't able to make her do something that she didn't want to do. Samantha, please. I was begging. I wasn't going to leave her here, and if it meant that my dreams of stopping a war were going up in flames, so be it. I was never a fan of doing things for the common good anyway. Consider me a little too individualistic. Or maybe I had come to care about this lost child too much. She wiped her eyes, turned back to me, and I could see that they were red from excessive crying. She threw herself at me, crying into my shoulder, and saying, 
I don't want to lose another person. She sobbed. I lost all my friends. I don't even know where my family is. But considering what's happened, I don't want to lose the last person that I've ever seen after all these months trapped here, especially since he's a decent and kind man. Her grip on me was tight. She needed someone to be there for her. I figured it was best to return her need for someone by hugging her and saying, I would never force you, Samantha. I merely want to get you to see the beauty of the sun again, to feel the brushing of grass. I want you to be free. Free with me, back on Earth. She moved her head up and our eyes locked. Those were the eyes of someone who had come to a decision. She lowered her head again and said, Fine. I'll go. I'm tired, anyway. Every night, I have a nightmare that threatens to kill me. If there was a reason to die now, at least it would be trying to escape this unbearable world. I was actually really thrilled. That took care of one issue. Now, on to the next. That was going to be finding as many explosives as possible for my plan to proceed. I looked through every house that I could find, every shop that was abandoned, and the police station was not spared in my search. You'd be surprised how many explosives there are in a city. Grenades were a surprise, but natural gas tanks, lighter fluid canisters, and C4 explosives were everywhere in this city. It took me about a month just to find everything that I would assume would cause a rather huge explosion. I was kind of hoping that there would be a tank in this city, but I guess they weren't near any National Guard posts. Just some destroyed Blackhawks and infantry assault vehicles that got crushed by something huge. The next stage of my plan was to find a large vehicle. A pickup truck would be preferable, and all that was left was finding a suitable route to drive through. Last, but not least, a sniper rifle. None of my current guns would offer me the precise shots that I would need. That part would also be easy. Like I said, there was a police station. There were also a lot of free bullets for me. The day before we made our escape, the two of us decided to eat what would maybe be our final meal. Two cans of raviolis. We sat in silence with one another. I think both of us were trying to push out thoughts of changing our mind the entire time but I can't say for certain for her. I was a little nervous. We had a limited supply of explosives. I'm much more skilled with a shotgun due to the fact that it just blows an entire section instead of pinpoint accuracy. Having second thoughts, she spoke abruptly. I inhaled deeply and said, Little bit. I think we'll make it. Why the optimism? Because I have nothing else if we don't make the trip. She was right. If we decided to give up right here and spend the rest of our lives in this place, it would only be a matter of time before something came along and killed us. Whether it would be the batteries of the shock collars going out while we were sleeping, or the rain getting us. Well, I promise I'll fight tooth and nail for you. I reassured her. I almost detected a smile escape, but quickly her face returned to its normal, stoic demeanor. You know, I'm a monster hunter. I'm a bit new at it, but I've already managed to help another monster incapacitate an even more dangerous one. Why tell me? Her eyes looked up at me. Well, I swallowed with hesitation. I was wondering if you'd like to join me. You don't have to. I can be sure you'll go looking for your family out there somewhere. My family lived here in the city. The mood quickly dawned on me. She was all alone. That would mean that she's an orphan now. I guess I'd have to think about some things from here on out. We made sure that we did have one way out, though. We each had a handgun in case we couldn't escape. The day was set. We had arrived. 
We pulled up towards the barrier in a pickup truck. Samantha was driving, and I told her to move forward in a straight line and don't have a panic attack at any moment. This was risky. I had grown more accustomed to these high-pressure situations, but even if she had lived here all this time, I find it rather unlikely that she would have the mental strength to handle the stress. I got down from the pickup truck, and the first thing we were going to use was our least needed explosive. Lighter fluid. I just want to test it out. I sat it down and ran back to the pickup truck, pointing the rifle at it, and then fired. There was a small plume of fire and smoke that, thankfully, the arms retreated, but not by much. That's why I got explosives. I must say, my ability to learn new skills, including shooting guns accurately, has been getting far more improved at a faster rate than before. Strange, I used to be a slow learner. But, anyhow, we began our tunneling expedition through the vine of arms. I placed a canister and blew a massive hole through it. We were so excited to have an exit, but going through the tunnel was an unnerving experience. Occasionally, I thought I saw a head poking out. It was a simple matter of patience, supply, and hoping we didn't have a dud on our hands. I looked back towards the entrance from where we came and saw that it was starting to close back up. But I also looked ahead, and I could swear I saw something poking through. An orange light, I believe. I think we were coming out to another end. The look on Samantha's face when she saw the light was also a little heartwarming for me. But just as we had gotten our hopes up, we both heard a low, growling sound coming from behind us. I pointed my sniper rifle back and peered through the scope. We had probably gone some 100 feet, maybe more, but at the entrance, just before it was about to fully close back up, a black, slimy liquid started pulling through, stretching out tendrils and hooking onto the hands. They looked to be trying to pull it apart, but it slipped through their grasp. I was immediately frightened by sudden honking from Samantha as she tried to get my attention. She rolled down the glass and said, Keep tunneling! Her eyes had this deathly fear in them that immediately got me back to our journey. I would start the process of planting an explosive, firing on it, or setting it off, and repeating. All the while, that shapeless creature was pulling itself closer towards us at a speed that was much faster than what our truck was able to go. I gave it a warning shot first, but my bullet passed right through it, meaning that this was not going to hurt it in the slightest. Well... It's not primordial, I remarked. Finally, I threw one of the natural gas tanks and fired at it. The explosion was much bigger than I anticipated, and a wave of flames overwhelmed our vehicle, with the sound of metal scraping against metal. Although I was fully dressed in fire-resistant clothes, my gloves were fingerless, so I was left with some burns on them. I fell down, my hands shaking from the sudden injury. Samantha was screaming, saying there was only one more left. It was a thin layer of arms that was still holding tight. She screamed. Should I ram it? I said, no, and staggered back to my feet, looking at another one of those natural gas tanks that we had. I was reluctant to use this again, but we had few other choices. And then that got me thinking. I grabbed the tank and threw it as hard as I could towards the gelatinous monster that was nearly on top of us. When the tank landed on the creature, I had a clear shot and fired. Again, flames started coming towards us, but this time they were a little further out and I was able to duck down in time. With this one out of the way, I threw my last grenade at the other end and watched as it blew a hole. Samantha floored it, giving me almost zero time to react as I nearly fell out of the pickup. Something told me that the arms knew what we were planning on doing and they were quickly trying to cover back over. Much faster than before, the slime creature was also gaining, stretching out its tentacles and its many eyes attached to them. We burst out of the exit, just as the hands nearly grabbed me by the head. The pickup bounced up and down as we drove across a harsh, dry desert with an orange sky and intense heat that hit me a lot harder than I was expecting. 
Samantha slammed hard on the brakes and only threw me forward. I rammed hard into the glass, breaking it in the process. Sorry, she sniffled. I was trying to ignore the fact that my nose and forehead hurt and saw that we were safe now. But oh, how wrong I was. I heard the carnivorous roaring of that monster following behind us as it came out through the hole. The arms were unable to get a grasp of it, and its dozens of eyes were locked on us. Drive! Drive now! I ordered, switching over to my AK-47. We drove as fast as we could on sand and gravel, but the wheels momentarily spun, giving the creature enough time to fire out one of its tendrils and hitting me through the shoulder just as I was taking aim. I fell down. We were moving now, but I was in excruciating pain. I quickly tried to remove the tactical gear and check my shoulder. I don't need another mysterious liquid going through my bloodstream. The pain was awful, and immediately I was coming out of my adrenaline rush. I laid in the back, staring up at the orange sky and trying my best to keep the pain to myself. I must have drifted out of consciousness, but I was immediately woken back up when I hit my head due to a stopping abruptly. Henry, look! Despite the fact that I didn't want to get up, I forced myself over to the edge of the truck and saw an obelisk made of obsidian with green symbols engraved onto its surface. Is that a nexus point? She asked. As far as I knew, it's better than nothing. I don't actually know what they look like, but it looks kind of weird, so it's good enough. All I did know is that they had a pointed top. She got out and quickly ran to my side. She had to hold me up as both of us trudged through the sand and up to the gigantic monolith. It was a very tall structure, and I questioned where exactly it was going to take us. Then, the next issue came about. How do I activate it? I need a moment, I said. I placed my hand on the stone and pictured home. Yet, that had done nothing. Perhaps we were wrong about it. A rush of pain overwhelmed me again, and I fell over. Samantha quickly laid me up against the stone. Please don't die. I'm sorry, I said, genuinely believing that I was. She had tears in her eyes, and she quickly went to hug me. I don't want to be alone again. Everyone I ever cared about is dead. My breathing was becoming heavier and more difficult. I can't believe this is how I go out. In a fit of rage, she punched the obelisk as hard as she could before spreading her palm over it. She wouldn't let go of me, but I really wish she would. I could see that monster right behind her, but I was losing strength quickly. I muttered, Behind you. With her hand still on the obelisk, she said, I want to go home. The creature was about on top of us, and it had one of its huge, gaping mouths wide open. I closed my eyes, accepting my fate, but also disappointed that I wasn't able to save her. But I was disturbed when I heard sparking sounds. Electricity was flowing upwards, and a loud crackle of thunder and a bright light that overwhelmed my eyes, temporarily blinding me. I was also weightless for a brief few seconds before being dropped down onto a concrete road. Samantha was next to me, looking around in confusion. Wait, this place looks like... Blood was still rushing out of my shoulder wound and I was passing out again. The last thing I saw was a semi-truck approaching us on the road. When I woke up, I was in a hospital bed. Next to me, Samantha sat up in hers and was eating some of the hospital food with a lack of table manners. I couldn't blame her. It's probably the best food she's had in a long time. As for me... I pieced together that she had gotten that truck driver to bring us here. 
When I asked, she said that the doctors were kind enough to give the both of us a room together. She said that I was her father. I was touched, glad to see she had that level of comfort about me. Well, we survived. I smiled at her. She returned the smile and went back to eating. She looked like she could finally relax for the first time in forever. But sleep still eluded her. She seemed more restless than before. Some things came to light during my stay in Colorado. Once I had made somewhat of a recovery, Samantha and I went to look up her city to see if it ever existed. It doesn't. She says it used to be the second largest city in Colorado, and where we ended up was where it used to be. It seems to me that something deleted her city from existence in our world. And also, her identity had also been erased. She had a fresh start, with no one who knew her other than me. Apparently, this city was called Warmire, Colorado. Another shocking revelation was that we'd actually gone back a few weeks before I went on my journey. I kept this to myself, because I was afraid that she would try to go and prevent me from going into that town in Kentucky. There was that chance she might believe it would have been better for me. But we survived and made it back, so I'm satisfied. If she did that, this could prevent my own self from existing, and it would also prevent her from escaping. I wasn't sure if she would do it, but best not to take the chance. But I did find it strange that I still existed. Perhaps the time traveling has something to do with this. I spent my last few weeks recovering before we had to take a Greyhound bus back to Auburndale. I made sure to arrive on the day that I had left. So now, I have a daughter that is staying with me at the moment. Normally, I would say that we should have gone through the whole adoption process, but how do you do that with a girl that doesn't exist? If you have an idea, feel free to speak up. As I finish typing this out, Samantha is currently sleeping in her room. I check on her every now and then to make sure that she isn't having a nightmare. But, for the first time in so long, she's getting a good night's sleep. I should probably get some sleep, too. For now, take care. I look forward to my next update. This is Henry Miller, out.